I want to talk to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, about uh, farming calendars. Uh, but before that, let me just uh, uh, lead us into how we became farmers. Uh, we know that uh, Homo sapiens, that's us, uh, developed in Africa. Professor Oppenheimer has showed that conclusively with DNA research. We got out of Africa because of the Ice Age. Uh, when, when the ice was about two miles deep uh, over uh, the north of England, uh, a lot of the sea levels fell. And we know that early civilizations took place in uh, equatorial areas because it's still warm enough to live there, and in the river valleys. Uh, and, uh, of course, when the ice began to melt, um, then it was more difficult uh, to live in a river valley. Uh, and that's perhaps why people moved out of the South China Sea into China and uh, out of the Persian Gulf into Mesopotamia. Uh, and indeed, eventually, out of the area around the freshwater lake, the Black Sea, which became a saltwater lake uh, when the Mediterranean got through the Hellespont. And that's probably why we get all these stories which are similar to the stories of Noah in the Bible. And no doubt tomorrow, tomorrow Edward Marriage will, will uh, mention this when, when he talks uh, uh, tomorrow about the development of farming in the uh, Palestine area. We know about the civilizations in uh, river valleys now under the sea because we've heard uh, from that in the past from, from Graham Hancock. We may hear more about that from him later today. We do know, however, uh, that our ancestors here in Britain uh, had taken refuge from the ice in Iberia, and we lived largely in the area which is now the Basque country until uh, the ice began to retreat and as hunter-gatherers, our foodstuff began to move north again, and we moved with it. Just like the Sami people in Lapland today uh, go up and, up and down in, in Finland uh, with the reindeers and the seasons, so our ancestors did the same here, and we have the archaeological evidence to prove it. However, the sea finally made Britain an island about 5,800 BC, and at that time we were still hunter-gatherers. We weren't yet farmers. The farming activity in uh, the uh, Palestine, Turkey, Mesopotamian area took about 5,000 years to get here. So when people got to the coasts of France and looked across at the cliffs of Albion, uh, there were no farmers over here. So the farmers that did come here had to come by sea, probably in boats a bit like the Irish Curragh. Instead, instead of canvas over wicker, it would have been hide over wicker. But of course, the problem if you're a farmer is that you need a calendar. You need to know when to reap and sow, when to plant, when to move animals off ground that's going to flood. But of course, nobody in uh, 4000 BC, when the farmers got to Britain, uh, had in fact yet invented reading and writing. And I suggest that the long distance alignments that we uh, see so often are in fact very many of them originally Neolithic farming calendars which continued into the Bronze Age and indeed the Iron Age because it was only uh, when the Romans brought Latin here that even the upper classes began to have uh, reading and writing. Uh, and in those days probably it was only the upper classes in the church. Most people didn't read and write until perhaps about two or three hundred years ago. Although the church gave us a calendar. One of my theories is that the church has pinched our uh, um, Stone Age calendar and simply overlaid Christianity on it. But when we look at where these calendars go, we find that there's lots of good clues. First of all, place names. Let's see if this will now work. Ah, let's go back one. Here we have, uh, I use the word lays because it's a, it's a more convenient word than alignment, but I won't pretend to say I know what a ley line is. But on alignments, you often get names like these I show here, associated with the gods, the saints, the devils, or with fire and color. That's a good clue to a place name if you're looking at the sunrise at dawn or sunset in uh, the evening then it's often you're going to find hills called uh, Golden Hill or Red Hill or, or uh, places like Bleeden. And these names crop up all over the map. 
You also get names associated with movement, uh, like an arrow or a shaft. Uh, and sometimes you get uh, names which are relating to uh, arrows which uh, have been mis misunderstood. Wibbeliskum in, in, in the uh, Somerset, Devon area, uh, people will tell you, oh, well, if you look at a uh, place name description, that means the Valley of the Arrow Makers. I suggest it's the Valley of the Shaft or the Beam of the Sun. Similarly, you get names associated with uh, structures, like uh, hinges and stone circles. Great problem for the church originally, no doubt. Names which crop up time and time again, which appear to be on these long-distance alignments. So if you get a map and you plot all the Neolithic and Bronze Age sites, the standing stones, the megaliths, the hinges, the stone circles, the long barrows, the round barrows, and you plot all the pre-Reformation Christian sites, whether it's a cross or a chapel or a church, you find, don't you, lots and lots of straight lines. Now, the archaeologists used to say, well, that's pure coincidence. Uh, but if you know a bit about statistics, you will know that there comes a time when the boot's on the other foot and that there are so many of these alignments, it cannot all be coincidental, even if some of them are. And so what we have are a series of these straight lines. And if you say, well, where do they go? They usually go to a hilltop or a coal. In other words, they give you a, an horizon feature. And if you look at uh, what was the sun doing at that horizon feature, you can get a date when the sun comes out of that horizon feature. You can actually get hold of this information if you go to the uh, Greenwich Observatory, uh, which is no longer at Greenwich, and it's now at Cambridge University, and is run by the people that run CERN, the European Accelerator. They have a computer system that can give you, if you give them the latitude and longitude, uh, the uh, date um, of sunrise at that point. Convenient date very often is about 3000 BC. And you will find if you look at these alignments and they go through a hilltop or to a coal, and you can actually get the date that the sun was rising there. And very often these are dates which we would now say are in the Neolithic. So the whole thing becomes scientific and understandable rather than perhaps uh, more difficult to interpret. And I'm saying that the, the names that you find to do with uh, saints or fire, or color, movement, structures or topographic are often a key to these things. And I'm gonna see if I can make this thing work. Here are some of the features which you will find on them. A boulder, a cave, a hilltop. And it's interesting sometimes that you also, talking about our last speaker and quartz, you will find that occasionally you get Logan stones on these alignments. Logan stone is a giant rock uh, which can be rocked. And of course, when you rock a very heavy rock weighing many, many tons, you create an enormous pressure at its very small point of contact. And you will find that these rocking stones, or Logan stones, are invariably on either quartz or made of quartz. So you're going to get piezoelectric energy, as we heard from the last speaker. You will also find that our ancestors were uh, creating uh, sites which relate to these uh, alignments, but very often aren't quite on them. If you, if you look at the uh, alignments that go near a henge or a stone circle, you find very often that they are tangential to them, as if it wasn't respectable to go into them. Perhaps the inside of the, the henge or the stone circle was either polluted or was sacred, and so your alignment shouldn't go into it. And usually you'll find that the alignment goes to an outlier, a standing stone just outside the, the henge or the stone circle. A good example of that uh, is at Stanton Drew, um, where you have a cove, of course, which is an in interesting feature because it probably mimics the, the female sexual organ. Because a lot of these alignments appear to be associated with our ancestors' religious belief. The belief of the Sky Father, the Sun, and the Earth Mother, uh, who uh, we still celebrate, perhaps without knowing it, um, at uh, the 2nd of February at Ingbolk or the uh, 1st of May, the, the name is the giveaway there, 
or the 31st of October, Halloween. All, of course, pinched by the church for its, uh, its own use, and I don't blame it, because they're only doing, after all, what the Pope told them to do in 601, when Gregory the Great, the Great told uh, Augustine, carry on letting these people worship where they're used to worshipping, just rededicate the site. Although, in fact, I suspect he wasn't dealing with pagans, he was dealing with British Christians, because we know uh, that two bishops from Britain were at the Council of Nicaea in 325. And here we are at Glastonbury, which has the uh, paramount antiquity of all uh, Christian features in Europe, and was accepted as such by the medieval church. So it may well be that the arguments uh, were really between the uh, early Christians uh, who had a different view of the date of Easter from the Roman Catholic Christians. Uh, interesting that this might be also the reason when you get the uh, Devonshire man, uh, St. Boniface, going to uh, take Christianity to the Germans. In fact, he's perhaps taking Roman Catholic Christianity to people that may have had uh, an earlier view. And you get into the great disputes about the Aryan philosophy which seems to be very much like a re repeat of the dispute between the Protestants and the Catholics uh, in the late medieval period. Should I get away from that? That view, the circle in the middle. I'm saying that your calendar is wherever the sun rises on these dates. And because the sun uh, rises at these different sites, you are going to have to move to have a convenient alignment, but if you plotted all, all the alignments as if it was on one map, uh, that would be you in the middle. And if you look at these alignments, you've got midsummer sunrise on the top right and midsummer sunset uh, sunrise in the winter uh, on the uh, bottom right, and you have that arc during which the sun travels. And of course it travels all the way around to the top left at midsummer sunset. Never rises or sets in the north. It's interesting that Christian churches to this day refer to the churchyard on the north side of the church as the devil's side. Uh, that's where the likes of you and I would have been buried because uh, that was the layman's side. Uh, the, uh, the monks were always buried on the southeast side because uh, that was nearest to sunrise for the second coming. But if you're a farmer, it's very convenient to know... Um, the highest point of the sun at noon on the longest day. You know the longest day because that's the furthest north the sun rises. You know the shortest day because that's the furthest south the sun rises. And it's quite important to know these other dates. Uh, Beltane, 1st of May. Lammas, 2nd of August. Imbolc, 2nd of February. Samhain, 31st of October. And of course the equinoxes. And I've found both on the Mendix and on the Purbex, and where I live in South East Dorset, formerly South West Hampshire, we've got these alignments, and they're quite recognisable. You can plot them on a map and go and look at them for yourself. And you can actually find that they're still there. And usually they are going through sites which have been recognised in the past uh, by churches, for example, Christ Church Priory, St Catherine's Chapel. They're all there, and standing stones. Uh, there's an extremely fine um, uh, dolmen uh, on Red Hill, south of uh, Ludgate Airport at Bristol, which lines up with the Wimblestone, a word that means fire axle, and goes through a whole series of eight other stones and interesting place names till it comes to Pole Perro on the Cornish coast, which of course is Fire Harbour. They still have celebrations lighting fires on Midsummer's Day. So these things have lasted, and they're still there if you look for them. One of the sites these alignments goes through is to Will's Neck. You say, well, what the devil's that to do with? Well, Will's Neck is the highest point uh, on the Quantocks, and Will is a byname to the sun, because you all know the sun has been called different times Bell, and of course from Bell you get Bill, and from Bill you get Will. And William, according to the church, means the protective one, Liam protected by the sun. So these names still exist on maps if you know how to interpret them. And it's interesting that Will's neck, from the right angle, appears to have the sun sitting on it. So the sun is the head, and the high point on the Quantox is the neck on which Will or Bell or Bill, the sun is sitting. 
So if you're a farmer, you can have your own calendar. Uh, at Christchurch Priory, we have 13 of these alignments going through it. What's interesting is that they all rise on the chalk of Purbeck or the chalk of Cranbourne Chase. And of course, chalk was an easier thing to work if you were a Stone Age farmer, only with the Stone Age ads, no metal. So you couldn't work in the valleys because you couldn't plough the heavy clay, you couldn't uh, clear the floods, and you couldn't clear all the fallen trees because when a tree falls, if there are no woodmen to clear it, it stays where it is, leaning on another tree. If you do that for a few thousand years, you have an impenetrable root, which of course is why Stone Age men went along hilltops, along ridgeways. And if you're up on the chalk, you can in fact break up the chalk because there are fewer trees on it. The earth is only a couple of inches thick on the chalk, so you, you can use your adze to break the ground up. You can't yet plough it, but you can break the ground and put your seeds in. And it's surprising, therefore, that we have these alignments that go from things like the Hellstone, the Rentstone, the Harpstone, the Puckstone, the Agglestone, through sites like Christchurch Priory or, or like the uh, Priory Church at Wareham, which are all on uh, pre-Christian sites, all very ancient sites, and end up uh, in either the Isle of Wight from Cranbourne Chase onto uh, barrows and hilltops like St. Catherine's Point, or end up in the New Forest on barrows or hilltops or both. And sometimes you can even find stones that have been lost. Uh, looking at an alignment that goes from the Puck Stone through Christchurch Priory, th through uh, Staple Cross, uh, into a barrow in the forest, if you walk along the route, you will find at Wooten there is a sarsen stone, which is not local geology to that part of the world, worked all over, smoothed all over, and uh, there it is, smack on the alignment. When I reported it to the Hampshire County Museum Service, uh, they were pleased to know about it, but they told me something I didn't know. The stone is on the former boundary between the old parishes of Milton and Brockenhurst. So it looks as though uh, we have a situation where the um, stones which were being used in the Neolithic were still being used in Christian times, perhaps two and a half, three and a half, four thousand years later. So it's not, perhaps not surprising that some of them lasted into history, into the times when people were making maps, or people were setting out uh, Christian um, areas for uh, parishes. I'm suggesting that some of our famous crosses, which we regard perhaps as the uh, cross of the Knights Templar, or more popularly for us today, the cross of St. George, are in fact based upon this early calendar system. Uh, the sun at the highest point and the uh, equinox. So we get uh, initially a, a cross without a, a, a spike at the top, uh, which of course Christianity has adopted more recently because they're pinching that from the Bronze Age, because this type of cross was a Bronze Age uh, fire symbol. We can find it on stones in, in Sweden. And uh, we also find, the, find the, uh, the cross with just the uh, um, vertical bar up to the equinoxes uh, on the Balearic Islands, still to this day, made of stone. Why don't it give me two? Here we are. The one you saw before, I'm suggesting, is like the cross of the Hospitallers, or the cross of St. Andrew, or the cross of uh, St. Patrick, uh, where you simply say, well, we're not look to the equinoxes and the sun and the north, we'll just look at the difference between um, the sunrise and Beltane, and the sunrise in the winter, and Imbolc, and you create this shape of cross. Gone too far. Come back. I'm having trouble with this. Yes, please. I want to get back to the crosses. That's the one I wanted. Okay. 
This cross we would call the Maltese cross, wouldn't we? But it was also the one used by the Teutonic Knights, which is why the Prussians liked it so much. You get it with the, uh, the German Iron Cross. And again, you're simply saying, well, let us uh, take the difference between uh, Beltane and Imbolc uh, and uh, Midsummer Sunset and Midsummer Sunrise, and you generate a cross of this nature. So these things are still with us today, but we don't always recognize them for what they are. And uh, I think some people would be a bit, uh, a bit shocked, perhaps. Can we move to the next one? We've talked about that one. Associated with these key dates for farmers, you've got Christian festivals. Let's just look at these in turn. Beginning of the year for the Celts was beginning of spring. Second of February is the approximate date. <clears throat> these dates, of course, change from place to place the further north or south you go. Uh, they've also been mucked about with by the change in the calendar. Uh, give us back our 11 days. We had riots about that, didn't we, in about 1754? And you have the spring festival of Bride, the Celtic goddess of uh, the virgin of sexual potential, who was also a fire goddess. And Bride, of course, pinched by the church, she becomes St. Bridget, but she's still a virgin. So spring begins, very conveniently, it's the lambing season. And the Christians say, right, well, it's St. Bridget, and they celebrate candle mass. Entirely sensible, keep the date, just to Christianize it. Move on to the spring equinox. Very important date in the church. For the Jews, it regulates Passover. For the Christians, it regulates Easter. Uh, don't forget that uh, we say Easter, but the Celts would have known Esther as the horse goddess. At the uh, equinox in the spring, uh, you have to calculate Easter depending upon whether you're a Celtic Christian or a Roman Christian. And I had tremendous arguments about this. It was only settled at the uh, Synod of Whitby in 664. And even then, various Celtic saints uh, wouldn't accept it. Uh, because they said, well, uh, e Easter, you have to have the, uh, the first new moon after the equinox, and then it's the first Sunday. Uh, and the, I think the Catholics said it's the first uh, Sunday after the first Sunday after the equinox. So you, you get sort of the sort of argument about how many angels can dance on the head of a pin. It probably is very interesting for academics, but for most of us, we think it's frankly ridiculous. Then we go into April. And here at Glastonbury, I think April's really interesting because Celts used to count their seasons from dusk, not from dawn, as we do. So although we now have a, uh, a festival of the 1st of May, a fairly modern bank holiday, Celts would celebrate in the evening of the 30th of April, and they would go a maying. And uh, it upset uh, the powers that be so much that during the Commonwealth, Oliver Cromwell actually ruled out maypoles and going a maying, ruled out Christmas as well. You weren't supposed to sort of enjoy yourself when you were worshipping. And the reason was that young men and women would go out into the woods on the 30th of April, a maying, to practice sympathetic magic. If you have sex in the fields, you're setting a good example to the animals and the plants to be fruitful. This is why May was an unlucky month to get married in, because you didn't know who the father was if the girl was pregnant in May. The reason it's interesting at Glastonbury is because Queen Guinevere, Arthur's wife, announced she was going a maying. A bit scandalous, I think, for a married woman to go a maying. And she got kidnapped. And she was brought here to Glastonbury, according to folklore, and it took a bishop to intervene uh, to get Arthur and his wife back without a, a battle between uh, Celtic Christians. So summer begins on the 30th of April. I think climate's changed a bit. Perhaps it was warmer in those days. But we do have Maypole, Maypole and uh, singing in, in churches on church towers, and dancing. Dancing, of course, is something which can be uh, very naughty because it can lead to levicious, levicious behavior, uh, which can give us place names like Merryfield. And these places called Merry Hill or Merryfield are usually away from centers of population because what went on wasn't respectable. 
Then we get Midsummer, 21st of June. Um, church again gets in on the action. Uh, St. John the Baptist Day is the 24th of June. As I said, it's sometimes difficult to keep calendars tidy. But the sun is highest at midsummer, and bonfires used to be lit on hills to strengthen the sun because it gets weaker after Midsummer's Day. And then we start to celebrate harvest. Usually harvest festivals in September, but you get the first loaf of the new corn harvest by the 2nd of August, hence loaf mass, lamus, but that's the Christians tidying up the original name of the festival, which was Laganasa. Um, Lug, of course, is the Celtic god who the Christians uh, pinched as Michael, and then the Crusaders pinched again as George. Uh, the Romans knew Lug uh, as uh, Mercury's, chap who had knowledge of things at a distance. Uh, the Greeks knew him as Hermes, the Egyptians knew him as Thoth. So he was a universal god, and his name crops up all over the world in different places, diff different names, um, Lear in Ireland, Lou in Wales. Uh, in this part of the world, he's often Hod, as in Hod Hill, or Hob, as in Hobham, or Lod, uh, as in, or Lod, as in uh, Lod's Hole, or Spring. And the, these names are very, very popular in the West Country. So Lod was clearly a very important god, and he hung around a lot when the Christians came. They, they simply uh, let him carry, carry on. He was a god who had a, um, a shining hand. He was a shining one perhaps associated with the sun, because his name, L-U-G-H, appears sometimes as U-G-H, as a name for the sun god, or as O-G, a name for the sun god. So it's, it's a very common topographic name that crops up still, and people just don't realize what it means. Sun is highest at noon on Midsummer's Day, but in August it started to get uh, weaker, Harvest has begun, first loaf, Lugnasa, and that's the only time that we seem to have a male god being celebrated, because we have a bride in February and May in May, and then only Lug or Michael in August. But we do have Michaelmas in September near the autumn equinox, 21st of September the equinox usually, Michaelmas is about the 29th. Start to prepare for winter, hold fairs, cull animals, change jobs, pay debts. Um, and it's harvest festival time in the modern church. We move on to 31st of October, and we all know Halloween, don't we? People even write letters to the papers today complaining about children devil worshipping because they're wearing pointed hats. Interestingly enough, those pointed hats are probably similar to the ones that Druids wore. But again, at Halloween, uh, the church says, well, in fact, you may celebrate on the evening of the 31st. We celebrate on the 1st of November, because that's the date of uh, uh, All Hallows. And on the 2nd of November, it's All Saints. And basically, it's a celebration of the ancestors, a celebration of the dead. An important time, because winter begins. Uh, you like bonfires? We have, of course, bonfires on the 5th of November for Guy Fox very close to the key date. And the, these celebrations uh, go back into the mists of time. And uh, we don't perhaps give it sufficient thought. Celebrating the ancestors seems to me to be an entirely reasonable and respectable thing to do. And of course we do celebrate the dead of the wars on the 11th of November, which is close to the date, because don't forget, if you take the 11 days back when the calendar changed, uh, you're back at uh, Halloween, aren't you? And then we get to perhaps our most important festival these days, because uh, we may be nominally Christian, but very few people, I suspect, uh, uh, respect Lent and give up lots of things. But everybody tends to like a nice blowout and a drink at Christmas time. And yet the date's not quite right, because the 21st of December is usually the winter solstice, when the sun is at its weakest, and everybody would have been a bit frightened, is it going to disappear and leave us in the dark forever? But it comes back. But the sun is marking time, and it's difficult to tell it's coming back until the 25th, when you can be sure, yes, it has moved north again. Big sigh of relief, big celebration. And the reason that the Christians took the 25th of December as Christ's birthday, because nobody knew when he was born, is because Mithras, the Roman god of the Roman soldiers, his birthday was the 25th. So again, it was convenient in the 4th century 
to adopt that date. It's interesting uh, that uh, the Yule fires would last uh, for 12 days, 6th day of Christmas, 12th day of Christmas on the 6th of January, is of course a, a remnant of the, uh, the Roman 12 day celebration, the calendars. And something else that's quite interesting is the fact that uh, we used to celebrate, and you still get it on Christmas cards, the idea of a boar's head, perhaps with an orange in it, an exotic fruit. Uh, and yet we now know, thanks to archaeology, that people at uh, the Windmill Hill area, the people who were associated with Stonehenge, were eating uh, pork at that time because they found, the archaeologists found the bones of young pigs born that year and so they were, they were eat, eating um, uh, delightful uh, barbecues of uh, a tender young pig at this time of year. Perhaps what isn't quite so pleasant to know about that is that uh, cannibals in the Pacific refer to human flesh as long pig because apparently our flesh tastes similar to pork. So were our ancestors remembering perhaps uh, head hunting or eating human flesh, even if they'd become more civilized and settled down no longer as traveling hunter-gatherers, but as less nomadic as, as farmers. It's, a, it's an interesting thought to consider. And that's perhaps another reason why Cromwell banned Christmas, because he was quite a knowledgeable chap about the Bible, and perhaps he, he knew more about it than perhaps many of the regular Christians did. Interestingly enough, I think I've got time, uh, we now have a good idea as to when Christ was born. Uh, we know, for example, that Augustus Caesar called the, uh, um, what do you call it when you have a collection of information, census, in 8 BC. And communications being what there were, it probably meant that the, the census didn't take place until 7 BC. We know from the Bible uh, that Herod was going to kill the boy children to make sure that he wasn't usurped by this new king. But Herod died in 4 BC. So we know the monk who worked it out got the date wrong by seven years. And we think that the date actually was 7 BC, about the 15th of September, because at that same time there was a conjunction of, of uh, Saturn and Venus which would have been a bright light in the sky for the, for the uh, three Magi to, to follow. And we know that the date that happened was the 15th of September. Interestingly enough, the Jewish New Year, I believe, is the 17th of September. And we know from the Bible that the um, shepherds in Palestine were out bringing in their animals that evening, that night. Well, I can tell you, they don't do it in late December because it's too damn cold. To this very day, shepherds in Palestine bring their sheep in, to keep them indoors in mid-September. So we've got good evidence, I think, that Christ was born probably in mid-September. The date itself, of course, doesn't matter. It's the message Christ brought that uh, what really matters. Uh, but it's interesting that from folklore and science and facts, you can put together information which makes sense of things which sometimes don't sound sensible at all. We move to the next slide. And here we come to examples of folklore. And I'm suggesting that things on alignments relate to either time and light, or movement and travel, or sex and fertility, or healing and renewal, or death and the devil. And I give examples. Um, Saints Day is to do with time, festival dates, place names, as I've mentioned, golden, red, bright, Flash, which in Celtic was often basic, white, sunlight names, sunbeam, shaft, bolt, arrow, flight, spear, Lug with his silver spear, Michael with his spear, George with his spear. Interestingly enough, you know, the pictures of Michael and George don't always show them as using the head of the spear on the dragon. Sometimes they're using the butt, and the butt of a Celtic spear was balanced with a metal band, so you've got metal at both ends. Interesting thought, if dragons were meant to represent energy, of course you can earth energy with metal. And perhaps they weren't killing the dragon, they were taming it or earthing it. Names associated with leaping animals, white animals, shining ones, 
Michael the Archangel, changes in perception. How many fairy tales talk about people going to sleep and a hundred years have passed? Or going to sleep on a barrow and, w and waking up uh, hundreds of years later? Shape changing, the idea of Merlin, uh, his cloak, and Hercules with his uh, lion skin. Um, lizards, like druids, saints' journeys, spirit journeys out of bodies by shaman. All of which relate to knowledge, and I suggest that knowledge is a calendrical knowledge. And so this knowledge was often kept secret because it was powerful, and you still get uh, strange stories occurring. Where I live, there are all sorts of stories about stones moving from St. Catherine's Hill to Christchurch Priory. But that's a common story found on alignments of stones moving. Similarly, we have stories of tunnels, and I su suggest these are memories of the alignments again, because tunnels don't make sense in land that floods and is only made of sand. Travel stories, the fairy people, people being pixelated at lay crossings, people flying, um, old road junctions like crossroads, leaping, devils leaping sometimes, racing, games. Nobody knows what the curses are for, either at Stonehenge or, or the curses near Knowlton. Uh, perhaps they're race courses associated with celebrations. Fairs, luxuries from abroad. Stories about the respect to positions for stones. It's bad luck to move them. And how often were stones being pulled out to look for uh, bullion underneath them? Uh, and I suggest it wasn't bullion that the stones are associated with, it was knowledge. We've been given a clue. Perhaps sometimes that knowledge may have been a form of, of uh, radio. I don't know. But knowledge at a distance is what Lug and Mercury and Hermes were famous for. And then something all we chaps are interested in, sex. How many fairy tales have walls opening or closing? Standing stones, shadows of stones, the shadow of the heel stone, which of course nothing to do with the heel on the body, it's corruption of Helios, the hell's sunstone, whose shadow at Stonehenge on um, Midsummer's Dawn uh, goes between the central arch of the Trilithon. In other words, the sun gods penetrating the earth mother. Gates and portals, wells and springs, all water, of course, comes from the earth mother, comes from the ground. She, she is the ground. The Silbury Hill is her, her pregnant belly. And uh, we even get her name with springs which have become rivers. The River Avon belongs to the earth mother. We have six avens in Scotland, six avens in England. And that's because her very early name was Ver. And that belonging to Ver was Aver. Avern, Avon. And of course, uh, how often do children's fairy tales and uh, myths talk about the virginity of the young woman, the bride-to-be, and it's all associated with sex and the sites that these stories are told about, sometimes castles on hilltops, when well, the hilltop was there before the castle. Mounds, harvest hills, a pregnancy, the earth mother's name, um, very often the, the, the Virgin and baby Jesus are representatives of the Earth Mother because uh, Isis and Horus were picked up by early Christians and used as a, um, a celebration of the Virgin Mary and the baby Jesus, which is why, why we get the stories of the, uh, the Black Virgin, because sometimes these came from uh, the south coast of the, Medi the, the southern shores of the Mediterranean uh, and uh, were originally pictures of people from Africa, perhaps. Maypoles, which we know are phallic, dancing, merrymaking, which often led to orgies, which is why you get the stories of people turned into stones for dancing. I talked about sympathetic magic, the maying, uh, fruitfulness, fertility, princesses, always beautiful, white ladies, horses, powerful, kings, royalty, King Arthur, dragons and serpents, associated with sex very often, bulls certainly associated with sex, and the green man, uh, who of course you find him in churches, uh, he's the god with tendrils growing out of his uh, seven orifices in his head, his name is Puck, and he gives his name to think places like Pokestown or Puckle Church. So it's all associated with knowledge, and in this case it's carnal knowledge. So you ain't going to let that be publicly known if you're one of the uh, wizard priest kings who knows about this. Next one, please. And healing. 
very important. Rob, Robin Heath will probably be talking about healing later today. Uh, I sit on this committee with Professor Wainwright that's done a lot of recent archaeological work with Bournemouth University at Stonehenge, so I went to tread on uh, Robin's toes and talking much about that. But again, uh, the knowledge involved with healing is powerful, medical knowledge, but you get it on alignments and uh, at focus points where alignments cross, just as you do with stories associating with death, ghosts, apparitions, the devil, lots of old names for the devil, old Harry Rocks on Purbeck is one, uh, old Nick, uh, the old one, or the old woman in some cases. Black animals, cats, dogs, bulls, bears, horses, ravens, eagles, and in some cases the blue boar, and these are all interestingly enough pub names, aren't they? The wild hunt, hern, and cern, and storms, all in folklore stories, and all at places where there are many alignments. I mean, the CERN has got about over two dozen alignments associated with that area. And there is a lovely stone that Peter Knight found some years ago, which is on the Beltane line that runs straight across uh, the giant uh, on the, uh, the date of about the 1st of May. Stories to do with funeral cortages, funeral routes, and of course, unusual occurrences. And sometimes these unusual occurrences can be explained. Uh, I think Paul Deverell has shown that the earth lights that you get in certain places in the States and in Wales and indeed in Christchurch Bay are associated apparently with faults in the ground where there must be very deep pressures under the earth, which again can create these uh, lights, as we've already heard this morning, associated perhaps with pressure on, um, oh, I keep losing words. But you know the word I mean, don't you? Crystals. And one thing that I'm interested in um, are ghost sites on these alignments. Um, I don't pretend to know what a ghost is, but I do collect information about them. And you tend to find it's where there have been strong emotions. And perhaps it's because people were anxious at the points at which perhaps were a backsite to an alignment, like a um, a burial, uh, a barrow, um, you just put somebody into the grave or added somebody to the family grave, which was its claim to land. Or perhaps it's to do with some other form of imprint from a stressed brain. And here we come to one interesting point which I'll conclude with, and that is that although I think many of these alignments are not accidental, they're deliberate farming calendars, people who talk about earth energies aren't totally wrong because you know lightning does strike in the same place twice. In fact, it repeatedly strikes in the same place, which is after all why we have lightning conductors on tall buildings and ship's masts. And it tends to strike on the same place because there's perhaps rocks exposed on a hilltop. And if that hilltop is a convenient focus point for a, a calendar, um, and it's also where it's frequently struck by lightning, a person who is sensitive, whether they're dowsing or not, may well pick up a change in the local magnetic field, because that's what lightning strikes do. They create an immediate local change in the Earth's magnetic field. So you could detect an energy change there. And if it's on a site which has been used as a calendar, uh, then you will get these two completely disparate points of view coming together. Uh, so we should never rubbish what each other say. Whatever views we have, all we really have is a piece of a jigsaw and we should respect everybody else's point of view. Thank you. In Turkey, Mesopotamian area, it took about 5,000 years to get here. So when people got to the coasts of France and looked across at the cliffs of Albion, uh, there were no farmers over here. So the farmers that did come here had to come by sea, probably in boats a bit like the Irish Curra. Instead of canvas over wicker, it would have been hide over wicker. 
But of course, the problem if you're a farmer is that you need a calendar. You need to know when to reap and sow, when to plant, when to move animals off ground that's going to flood. But of course, nobody in 4000 BC, when the farmers got to Britain, uh, had in fact yet invented reading and writing. And I suggest that the long distance alignments that we uh, see so often are in fact very many of them originally Neolithic farming calendars which continued into the Bronze Age and indeed the Iron Age because it was only uh, when the Romans brought Latin here that even the upper classes began to have uh, reading and writing. Uh, and in those days probably it was only the upper classes in the church. Most people didn't read and write until perhaps about two or three hundred years ago. I want to talk to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, about uh, farming calendars. Uh, but before that, let me just uh, uh, lead us into how we became farmers. Uh, we know that uh, Homo sapiens, that's us, uh, developed in Africa. Professor Oppenheimer has showed that conclusively with DNA research. We got out of Africa because of the Ice Age. Uh, when, when the ice was about two miles deep uh, over uh, the north of England, uh, a lot of the sea levels fell. And we know that early civilizations took place in uh, equatorial areas because it's still warm enough to live there, and in the river valleys. Uh, and, uh, of course, when the ice began to melt, um, then it was more difficult uh, to live in a river valley. Uh, and that's perhaps why people moved out of the South China Sea into China and uh, out of the Persian Gulf into Mesopotamia. Uh, and indeed, eventually, out of the area around the freshwater lake, the Black Sea, which became a saltwater lake uh, when the Mediterranean got through the Hellespont. And that's probably why we get all these stories, which are similar to the stories of Noah in the Bible. And no doubt tomorrow, tomorrow Edward Marriage will, will uh, mention this when, when he talks uh, uh, tomorrow about the development of farming in the uh, Palestine area. We know about the civilizations in uh, river valleys now under the sea because we've heard uh, from that in the past from, from Graham Hancock. We may hear more about that from him later today. We do know, however, that our ancestors here in Britain uh, had taken refuge from the ice in Iberia, and we lived largely in the area which is now the Basque country until uh, the ice began to retreat and as hunter-gatherers, our foodstuff began to move north again, and we moved with it. Just like the Sami people in Lapland today uh, go up and, up and down in, in Finland uh, with the reindeers and the seasons, so our ancestors did the same here, and we have the archaeological evidence to prove it. However, the sea finally made Britain an island about 5,800 BC, and at that time we were still hunter-gatherers. We weren't yet farmers. The farming activity in uh, the uh, Palestine with movement, uh, like an arrow or a shaft. Uh, and sometimes you get uh, names which are relating to uh, arrows which uh, have been mis misunderstood. Wibbeliscombe in, in, in the uh, Somerset, Devon area, uh, people will tell you, oh well, if you look at a uh, place name description, that means the Valley of the Arrow Makers. I suggest it's the Valley of the Shaft or the Beam of the sun. Similarly, you get names associated with uh, structures like uh, hinges and stone circles. Great problem for the church originally, no doubt. Names which crop up time and time again, which appear to be on these long distance alignments. So if you get a map and you plot all the Neolithic and Bronze Age sites, the standing stones, the megaliths, the hinges, the stone circles, the long barrows, the round barrows, and you plot all the pre-Reformation Christian sites, whether it's a cross or a chapel or a church, you find, don't you, lots and lots of straight lines. Now, the archaeology, although the church gave us a calendar, one of my theories is that the church has pinched our uh, um, Stone Age calendar and simply overlaid Christianity on it. But when we look at where these calendars go, we find that there's lots of good clues. First of all, place names. See if this will now work. 
Oh, let's go back one. Here we have, uh, I use the word lays because it's a, it's a more convenient word than alignment, but I won't pretend to say I know what a ley line is. But on alignments, you often get names like these I show here, associated with the gods, the saints, the devils, or with fire and colour. That's a good clue to a place name if you're looking at the sunrise at dawn or sunset in uh, the evening then it's often you're going to find hills called uh, Golden Hill or Red Hill or, or uh, places like Bleeden. And these names crop up all over the map. You also get names associated